Hello, everyone. Welcome to The Reason We Learn. I'm your host, Deb Philman. At The Reason We Learn, we aspire to be part of the solution. The purpose of this show is to take a good, honest, potentially painful look at the way kids are being educated. We know we can do better, and this is where we'll talk about how. Let's learn something. Hi, everyone. Welcome to The Reason We Learn. I'm so glad you're here. If you are new to this channel and interested in being part of the solution to our education crisis, I hope you will subscribe to be notified when I make new content. If you're already a subscriber, thank you so much for supporting this channel. I hope you have hit the notification bell to be notified when I have new videos. Uh, Please also like and share this broadcast so others can benefit from the information we're about to share. I am so excited to have back in my studio, uh, Daniel Buck, who was here last time talking about his book about what's wrong with education. And today he's here to talk to us some more about how children actually learn and what are some things that he would like to see changed in the classroom. He's also going to tell us why he's no longer teaching. So without further ado, please join me in welcoming Dan Buck. Hello, hello. How are you? Good. Um, Looking outside this random 50 50 degree day in the middle of February in Wisconsin. And just, I spent more time than I should have during the workday outside today. Well, if it's 50 degrees in Wisconsin, that's balmy. That might as well be summer. You know, here in North Carolina, it's like you wake up, it's 20, and then it's 79 by the afternoon. And then, you you know, it's all over the place, so I can't predict. But uh, I'm glad you get some some good weather going up there because Midwest winters can be brutal. They really yeah, can. Your, eye, your eyelashes start to stick together if it gets so cold because they, yes. uh, the frost gets on there and then they freeze closed. Real weird stuff starts to happen up here. Yep. Exactly. And sometimes if you have, you know, like if you wear glasses too, like you're in and out and then it's like, I can't see. Mm-hmm. <laughs> that was always my problem. Yeah. Um, so this time that you're here, uh, you are, I didn't, I, I forgot, I meant to tell the audience that you are now not only not teaching, but you are a policy and editorial associate at the Fordham Institute. Congratulations. Thank you. Uh, of course, we want to know what, like you were a teacher who loved teaching. Like I would think to myself, you know, who do I know who's a teacher who just does it for the pure love of the job? And your book, What's What is Wrong with Our Schools, you know, was was really, I think, a labor of love. Like reading that book, you can see how much passion you had for teaching and instructing and all that. So why are you not doing it anymore? And then how does it feel to not be doing it anymore? Yeah. Why am I not doing it? Uh, my honest to goodness answer, this isn't the like polished political answer um, to win the voters or anything, was just I felt like I had to try out policy work. Um, I know I'm good at teaching and I know I'm good at writing. And when I explained it to my principal, uh, basically a, a few think tanks reached out and said, hey, do you want to work for us full time? And I explained to my principal, like, I have this opportunity. I got to try it um, and see. Maybe I'll love it. Maybe mm-hmm. I'll hate it. Maybe mm-hmm. I'll be really good at it. Um, there is the argument that uh, when you're working at a systems level, you're going to make more changes. You know, you have more time to write, more time to tell stories, more time to advocate for better policy and text the superintendent of this or that state and give them some advice. Um, so I just needed to try it out and see. Uh, how does it feel? I miss the classroom, admittedly. Um, I'm toying around with... What am I going to do? Am I going to do this think tank work long time? Am I going to found my own charter school? Uh, I can't go back to working in public schools at this point because I've expressed too many what are now um, unspeakable opinions. Like you should give kids suspensions if they're misbehaving. Yes, you Um, radical you. Yeah. Uh, So I have made myself unemployable in the public schools, which I think is a badge of honor. Um, but right now I'm just, I'm doing the policy work full time and I really like it. Get to hang out with my daughter. Your visual listeners and watchers can see the, uh, finger paintings behind me. Yes. Love it. Um, and I'm I'm like art. (laughs) Yes. That's exactly what it is. Yes. She's expressing her, her subconscious and is just a pure, um, un, uncorrupted bundle of Rousseauian perfection. (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> and here I thought it was social commentary. No, I'm kidding. Uh-huh. Um, you know, uh, so I, I I get all of this, weirdly enough, although I didn't have the policy offers and everything, but I get the whole, I miss the classroom, but I can't do it anymore at that, you know, that way, that level. 
Um, and the badge of honor. Yep. Know that one well too. So congrats. Welcome to the club of unemployables, the sort of the deplorables of the former of the education world. But I do think, I love the idea of you contemplating, you know, starting a school someday. Cause I do think that building that alternative sort of ecosystem is what we really need. We need more people like you who, uh, are capable and, you know, have the youth and energy and stuff to go do it too. Maybe you'll, rub elbows with some people in policy work will help you make it possible. Hint, hint. <laughs> Anyone watching, listening? Um, but I I also love the fact that somebody with your <clears throat> perspectives is working on policy. We need more people with different perspectives. There is very much a sort of one worldview, one track mind going on in education policy. And I'm pleased to hear that you are going to be contributing to that. Um, Speaking of education policy, a lot of it is directed at instructional methods, teaching methods, teaching styles, something we don't talk about a lot. There was a lot of talk around the science of reading. There was all that buzz around that for quite a while. But I think my audience of parents um, get bombarded, you know, they get bombarded with information about what their children need in terms of the teacher's method, the teacher's style of presentation, and they don't know what to think about it. You know, the experts say, or evidence shows, what we typically hear is evidence shows X, Y, Z. And there you've been in the classroom. And so I'm sure you've been either encouraged or outright told to do certain things. And you certainly know what the uh, popular uh, methods are. So I wanted to run some by you and get your take on why you think it's, you know, not so great is good. What, you know, the, okay. So first and foremost, what's very popular right now is the project-based learning or pro, they call it project-based learning, but it's really not about learning. It's more about the project-based teaching. So pros, cons, what do you see with that? Uh, yeah. Project-based learning. There is little to no evidence that it's effective. Um, there is a, you know, um, write up, I linked to it in my book. I can't recall the exact author right now, but the phrase he uses, and he's, he's pro project-based learning. This is a pro project-based learning essay, academic essay. And he acknowledges that there is a paucity of evidence, a lack of evidence. There's very little, um, research done into it that finds it, that it is effective. Mm -hmm. Um, in fact, quite a few um, there's one from the Education Endowment Foundation that finds, uh, you know, when English classrooms implement um, project-based learning curriculum, uh, reading scores actually tank, especially among poor minority students, the ones that, you know, the social justice advocates care mo the most about, as we rightly should, um, they're the ones who are harmed most by this. One of the questions is why? You know, it seems kind of intuitive. We learn by doing, so why shouldn't we learn through projects? That has to do with the, basically, uh, humanity's cognitive architecture. How do we think? So we have, to oversimplify, we kind of have two, two um, halves to our thinking. We have our working memory, which is our conscious thought. Um, you know, the words that you're thinking in your head, what you're seeing, what you're contemplating. It's very limited. And then we have our long-term memory, which is moves slowly, but it's functionally limitless. And all new knowledge has to fit through your working memory to make it into your long-term memory. That's what learning is. And I liken it often in my writing to a doorway. All new knowledge has to go through this little doorway to then get stored in the storage room. Problem is the doorway is pretty small. We can only think about four to seven things at a time depending on um, which researcher you're reading. Uh, you can demonstrate this um, numbers. You can memorize about out to seven numbers, but any more than that and you quickly lose it. Why phone numbers are only seven numbers long and then within that they're chunked. So you can kind of think 234, 7695, 234, 7695. And that kind of helps you keep it to two. Project-based learning, floods this working memory. You're thinking about your PowerPoint slide. You're thinking about the other people in your group. You're thinking about the content. 
you're thinking about what is the teacher saying when they're taught when they're working with the group next to you there's just so much going on that students might learn a fair amount about how to add animations to a powerpoint slide but they're not going to learn much about napoleon or the harlem renaissance or whatever it is that they're actually creating a presentation on because they're spending so much time in their working memory thinking about everything except for the content i see it just yeah. doesn't fit with how we think and learn What's much more effective is a teacher standing up front in a quiet room presenting, um, here's this diagram of how the solar system works and explaining it and keeping distractions down, keeping false information down, keeping all of that other stuff out of the way so kids can focus on what they're learning. And I would imagine too, another factor is that they're not taking notes with their hands. And I've read a lot of research about how important that is. Like people underestimate the power of actual handwriting. And of course, when you do it in cursive, it lasts even longer, mm -hmm. but we don't, we don't do that. But when you write with your hand on paper, there is proof that it is retained better in the brain and they're right. not and, doing that. And there's a cognitive explanation for that as well. Not everything that's in your working memory is going to necessarily make it into the long-term memory. It's what you think about. The more time you spend thinking about it, the more likely it is to kind of make that make its way into the storage room. Right. So you remember the meal that you ate at your wedding, but not what you had for lunch yesterday, because you spent a lot of time thinking about the food and planning for it and savoring it with your spouse there and having fun with your friends. You remember that because you thought about it a lot. But when you were eating lunch yesterday, me, I'm usually, I'm either eating with my family, so I'm thinking about conversation. I'm focused on, is my daughter, my uh, three-year-old daughter eating her food or using her fork as a banging instrument or trying to feed stuff to the dog? I'm thinking about other stuff. During the workday, sometimes I work, I'm not thinking about what I'm eating, so I don't remember it. In the classroom, when students are there taking notes by hand, that means they're listening to what the teacher says. They have to think about it, comprehend it themselves, then synthesize that information and write it out. They spend a lot of time processing that new information. When you're typing something out, it goes so quickly. It's, I mean, literally it's in one year, out the other. It goes in and it's almost this direct um, transfer from the board to the fingers onto the screen and kids just, they don't remember it because they don't oh. have to take time to think about it, synthesize it, and then write it out slowly by hand. And the AI finishes words for you. Yes. So if you for and and sometimes it finishes them incorrectly, but the kid sees a finished word and they just keep going. So uh, yeah, we're going to talk about screens, but I want to kind of stick on the you know one topic at a time. But um, so the name project based learning then sounds like a misnomer. It sounds more like it sounds more like project based activity or something or project based engagement. Like I hear administrators telling teachers a fair amount, and of course the people who sell the PBL training, that this keeps kids engaged. And so parents hear that too. But isn't this a great way to keep my child engaged? And so then I think back to what you were saying about what they're not, you know, they might learn a lot about making a PowerPoint, but not as much about Napoleon. And so I'm thinking, okay, engaged in what? And learning what? It's not that they're not learning anything. And it's not that they're not engaged in something, but is it possible that the things they're learning and engaged in are not necessarily the things you think they are or that you want them to be? Yeah, we over-prioritize engagement in education, where like you said, it's all about engaged in what? Are they making a, di a, a diorama? Gosh, the diorama, right? Remember they're engaged those? in I remember those. cutting and pasting and gluing and yeah. Um, putting little cotton balls on for clouds and it's just, then they don't, but they don't actually learn anything mm -hmm. then. They're just engaged in what's called, what's been called um, by this guy that I really like, Mike Schmoker. He calls it the Crayola curriculum where there's a lot of glitter and glue and razzmatazz, but no real learning of content. It's like, Ooh, your daughter learned how to use a hot glue gun. Great. <laughs> um, yeah. And then there's a second aspect, a second rebuttal I want to give to that um, engagement I think I'm, I'm going to avoid the use of the term lecture because that implies this teacher standing up front 
drawling a lot, drawling on about in a monotone voice, you know, um, Ferris Bueller's Day Off, Bueller, yeah, yeah. Bueller, which isn't what's um, explicit teaching is the the, no. the nerdy phrase that I'll use is explicit teaching can be very engaging. Um, I had some really dynamic instructors who stood at the board, but the way they did it, they were so passionate about their subject. They would lock eyes, make eye contact with you. Uh, they would do the thing that now teachers are discouraged from doing. They were just like calling people like rapid fire mm -hmm. calling people. But after a while you were like, Oh, I hope it's me. You know, like you're, you're kind of like waiting for the, you know, and it would just be all random. So teachers can do that really, really well and make class a lot of fun. I think people, like you said, they think of Ferris Bueller's teacher or Charlie Brown's teacher and that's it. Yeah. I mean, my students told me like, we appreciate Mr. Buck that you never lecture. And I'm thinking in my head, like half of every single class for me is usually, especially like my grammar classes is some sort of lecture. I'm either providing historical context for the book that we're reading, or I'm explaining, you know, what a direct object is, but you can mix in stories. You have call and response, you have discussion, uh, you have examples that you're giving and modeling and all of this stuff that you're doing that's very, very engaging. Like you said, some of my favorite teachers and professors from my own education just stood up front and went through PowerPoints. I remember one, Mr. Ossickson, God bless him, from an AP history teacher. But the way he taught history, it was all, you know, here are the facts, but then he'd tell stories to make these historical figures almost like characters in a novel. And it was like we were going in to watch um, a work of historical fiction in his lecture, not just this drawl, boring, dry lecture. So the idea that explicit teaching is inherently unengaging, I think, is a bit of a straw man. Right. But I think one of the things that might scare people, and by people, I mean teachers and administrators, is that it's an it's as much an art and a talent it's actually more of an art form and a talent than it is a skill in the sense that you, it's really hard to teach somebody to be that kind of teacher. And I think it can be in, in brought out in people. I think they can practice and get better. And I do, I have seen teachers like get better and better and better the, the longer they teach. But when you're trying to recruit lots and lots of warm bodies and a lot of the, you know, I hate to use this term, but best and brightest, whatever, you know, have other options like policymaking, um, <laughs> then I think it, it probably becomes harder. So it's, I can't help but wonder if the teaching styles are following the people rather than the, the people are grab, grabbing onto the teaching styles. Because oh. teachers like you aren't going to go, oh yes, let's do the latest fad thing called project-based learning. But people who are like, you mean I don't have to plan the night before anymore and I don't have to actually get up and stand there and and perform and do this whole thing? And oh, better yet, I don't even have to know the subject at all. I can come into the room with like a lesson plan that I printed off of Teachers Pay Teachers or I can stick them on a Chromebook with something someone else did somewhere else far away and Smithsonian or this or that and go here, do it. And I'm a teacher. Mm -hmm. And it, that, I wonder if that has a lot to do with it. No, I think that's definitely one factor. I mean, it is a lot of these kind of faddish things are easier. Um, and I relied on some of them, but I knew I was cutting corners. It was especially at this um, one school that I worked at where I had sixth, seventh and eighth grade plus uh, grammar classes for each class. And then like a this this other thing, I don't even remember what it was called, but I had like six or seven different classes in a day. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And I just didn't have time in my day to make that many plans. Sure. So sometimes I would do, okay, I know I'm teaching a new book with my eighth graders. So I'm going to do like this choice unit with my sixth graders where they spend most of the day reading. And I know, okay, I can grade these essays while they're reading. And it is, it's easier because you can multitask. You don't have to do as much prep. Um, I was consciously making those decisions. Um, and it was kind of like a, a, you know, working in also like, am I going to go home and ignore my family because I'm planning for three hours every night? Sure, no. Sure. So these are all trade-offs, but I think too many people aren't aware of those trade-offs and just go with um, what seems easiest and what seems engaging, even if it's not necessarily effective. 
Right. And then, of course, if you have people backing that decision up by saying research shows this is actually good or supports something that other people value, like, you know, engagement, the kids are going to be engaged and you hear that, okay, I'm, I'm doing a good thing. Um, the next kind of fad or, uh, that is really popular is student-led learning. And by the way, we hear this a lot in the homeschooling community too. You have a lot of people that say, oh, it's, you know, unschoolers do it, student-led learning. And even as a homeschooler, I try to, and, and at homeschool sort of guide or, you know, consultant type of thing, I tell parents, look, as with all things, you need to start with your child, <laughs> you know, especially with your homeschooling because you have that luxury. You don't have a room full of people. So, you know, there's no one method that suits all the children. So you, you have the luxury of starting with your kid and some kids might be able to run with things and just go and teach themselves, but that tends to be a minority of children. So when then I think about your typical classroom of 25 to 30 kids and I think, student-led learning, what's really going to be learned and what is the role of the teacher? So this is another one that parents are hearing. Well, research shows that when students co-construct, they'll use that expression, co-construct the learning or, you know, when they lead the lesson and all this. And I'm over here going, no, just no. Mm -hmm. And am I wrong? Am I too much of a, an old fashioned fuddy-duddy? No, you're totally on. You're, you're, you, you got it. <laughs> Um, there are some things, some knowledge in this world that we only glean through discovery and experimentation. You know who's doing that? Scientific researchers. On the forefront of human knowledge, discovering new things, the only way to figure that out is through experiment and research, discovery. Um, everything else that we've already learned there's a way more effective way to teach that to kids. And that is explain it to them. Um, where all of this student led co co created discovery learning is essentially asking students to repeat the discovery, the re like rediscover for themselves, all of human knowledge. It's a really inefficient way to learn. Why would we ask kids to be doing that? We already know how to do algebra and calculus. We already know about germ theory. Um, why, why are we asking them to try and discover these things on their own? Um, okay. There are few things also that kids can learn. So let me set up a, a, another dichotomy. I talked about working and long-term memory. Let's talk about primary and secondary learning. Primary learning is everything that we're kind of set up to learn naturally. So I'm gonna use my daughter as an example again. She learned to speak seemingly without effort. She learned to stand up and move just through experimentation and play. Um, basic physics, we can kind of learn on our own. What goes up comes down. Basic psychology, we kind of learn on our own. Um, you know, if I say something mean, my friend cries, I shouldn't do that anymore. Everything else though, everything that came after evolution is called secondary learning. All the stuff of culture, history, all the scientific and mathematical discoveries, all of that requires explanation. So even something as simple as brushing teeth, right? my daughter isn't gonna sit around and discover her way into how to brush her teeth. I, I remember watching when I was teaching her, she studied my face and I had to show her like, this is how you do it. And she watched me for 30 seconds and then kind of tried it on her own and was watching me. We learned through models. It's in, ingrained in how we learn. And so the best way for a kid to learn is just have something explained to them. It's the most effective way to learn. Um, again, there's there's research backing that up and I can get into it, but I've been rambling for a while. So I'll kick no, it No, no, no. I mean, and that, I mean, that basically covers it. I mean, yeah. it, it, it makes perfect sense. And I hope that people watching will stop and think about, you know, their own education and what worked and what didn't work. Cause think we don't do that enough either. We parents are like in this forward motion and like, just go, just, just go back. Think about what, you, what worked when you were a kid in school. And what did you say? I got out of that class and I didn't learn anything. Oh, the, the, the computer does this. Um, and if you're really honest with yourself, you'll, re you'll remember, you'll think about the teachers that even if you didn't like them, that you got out of their class and you knew things, that it was effective. Or you'll even realize like, you know, I probably would have learned more in that class, but I wasn't paying attention because I was goofing around or something like that. But that's very different than, you know, the teaching method failed. Um, 
And I, I think it's important for us to look at these teaching methods because first of all, they often attach the word learning to it as opposed to teaching. And then they'll tell you about learning styles. I could do a whole other video about how that's bogus, <laughs> but um, we're not going to go there. So I just want to stick to the teaching when they, they take something that's actually a teaching style or a teaching method and call it a learning style. No, it's not. Student-led learning, that's not how it works. And, and same thing, whether it's discovery or project-based learning, no, it's a project-based activity. Now you might be, as Daniel's pointed out, you might be demonstrating something you have learned. So I studied, you know, Mr. Buck taught me about Napoleon and taught me about, you know, whatever piece of literature or something. And we spent a month doing that. And now it's the end of the month. And he says, okay, for fun. And just to manifest everything you've learned about Napoleon or about this book, uh, do a PowerPoint presentation with two other people put together your notes and come up with something that, you know, answers this question or something like that. And, you know, make a PowerPoint presentation. Then it's not like you had to learn the stuff about it. Now, yes, you mm -hmm. are learning how to do a PowerPoint presentation. And there's some value to that. I'm not going to say there's zero, but if you had to learn all the Napoleon facts, it doesn't work. The other um, thing that we hear, and this is going to segue us into the technology conversation, is that using screens, one-to-one -one devices, whether it's a Chromebook, a laptop, or even a phone with things like Kahoot, blah, 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 um, is important because our students need to be prepared for the 21st century and to use technology, Mr. Buck. So you need to give them each their very own device and that will make them proficient. And, and not only that, they'll be inspired to go learn code or something, won't they? Of course, that's what's gonna happen. So this is what they need to be prepared and to be ready for 21st century skills to which you say. Uh, <laughs> I remember when I was in school, and we had our technology class. And you know what's all completely different since 20 years ago when I was in elementary school, 25 years ago when I was in elementary school, all of the technology, yes. everything that they taught us, all the software is now obsolete. So I don't know why we think, you know, we're gonna teach little Jimmy, the seven-year-old, some software, some technology, and that's going to prepare them for the future when none of that's going to be still in use. Technology is changing so quickly. Uh, you know what doesn't get outdated? Germ theory. You know what doesn't um, get outdated? The universal themes in classic literature and the lessons that we can draw from them about human nature and right and wrong and the good life and ideal societies and political theory and philosophy, all of these kinds of things. You know what doesn't get old? The necessity that we learn about the Holocaust or the civil rights movement or World War II. Those things don't go out of date. Right. Well, Software and technology does. Also, I mean, not for nothing, I'm quite a bit older than you are. And so I grew up in a period of time where we were still like it was kind of the cool thing when I was a kid to have a fountain pen. Like that, that was like extra special. I had several fountain pens because I liked how pretty that my writing was with them. So the thing about writing with your hand, aside from the cognitive benefits and paper and you know, and reading actual books that you turn the page and so forth is we if you don't do those things, you lose a measure of independence and personal autonomy with both your your learning and your um your creation. So when you're sitting there writing or when you're, you know anything you're doing, I could write if I have a pencil and a piece of paper, I can be anywhere. I don't need Wi-Fi, I don't need my computer, I don't need my battery to be working, I don't need to plug it in. I it's so low tech that I can do it anywhere. I mean heck, you can take a piece of charcoal and write on a stone. You know, they did that once upon a time. So you the the human empowerment of the old ways and the fact that no one can cut it off, like no one can take it away from you. If we had a blackout and there's no electricity for a week because there's a terrible storm, you know, a hurricane or something like that, you can't watch television, you can't play games, but you can read a book with a candle. Mm -hmm. Even if you have batteries and flashlight, you can read a book, you can entertain yourself, you can even play board games, that requires a little reading. But so what kind of concerns me is the, the impression I think that kids start to get is that both learning and interacting with knowledge is something that depends 
on something ex- outside of me that I have to wait on. Like it's very passive. Whereas the ways that we learned when we were in school are much more active. And I think there's something to that in terms of the ownership of the education. I feel like the apathy we we're saying, there are many, many reasons. It's super complex why there's apathy and all this, but I'm just saying it doesn't help. I don't think it helps when we do here. <laughs> there's mm-hmm. just this recipient feeling. There's this feeling of like, you're going to download it to me. I shouldn't have to do anything. What do you think? Yeah. Am I crazy? Machiavelli talks about how he spent four straight hours reading and it was one book. I don't remember if it was, you know, Virgil or Homer or I don't remember which classic author it was, but he talks about, you know, contesting with this author and almost intellectually sparring back and forth about what were these ideas and what was the, it was probably political theory because Machiavelli, but like when was the last time we just sat down and got so completely consumed by a book where we felt like we were in discussion with one of the greatest thinkers of all time. That's going to teach you to think critically, a phrase that I don't love. Um, Soren Kierkegaard. Actively. And, think actively. Yes. Think actively. Thank you. Soren Kierkegaard and um, a number of other thinkers talk about, you know, they would go for just eight hour walks and get lost mm-hmm. in their thought and think um, and plan out whole sections of their book because it gave them just space to really think deeply and process one idea for an extended period of time and draw it out and Sometimes you get distracted by the birds or, you know, what am I going to eat for dinner tonight? But then you come back and realize you're thinking about something in a new way. Phones, they habituate us into inattention. We're always flipping to another tab. We're always thinking about, uh, this is getting boring. Maybe I'll go look what's on the algorithm again. They teach us to have almost like frenetic thinking, always bouncing all over the place and not spending one, two, three, four, eight hours on one topic, just thinking actively and deeply about one thing. Yeah. And what you just described with that frenetic thinking too is a symptom of um, a kind of dopamine addiction too, so that you become a creature, quite literally, who uh, needs stimulation as opposed to, you know, interaction with information. And now, you know, you're putting something into it. What you're describing, he's walking outside thinking, you know, wrestling with his idea or Machiavelli is wrestling with this author. There is activity going on. That's why I I use active thinking. There is something going on where they're putting something into it. They're not being stimulated, kind of like a dog with a little bell ringing or something. And I happen to know that there is a return to behaviorism now, like in education, people are actively talking, like they're not even hiding it, about using generative AI and and, uh, adaptive learning devices to stimulate students, like give them a stimuli and then get the response. Oh, not the right response, stimulate them with something else, get the right response. But that gives me the creeps because who decides what the right response is? We've already decided that getting the right answer is not the end goal, right? We keep hearing about that. So I'm really nervous that we're getting back to like Skinnerian kind of ideas with the technology because the technology does create that stimulus response interaction and the student is not even aware, especially the younger you start, they're not even aware that it's not them doing whatever the thing is, that Mm -hmm. the thing is responding to them according to what they put in and they're, and they may only get back according to what they did, not, you know, it's not up to them. It's not, they're not in control. Yeah. Uh, I mean, we can even use behaviorism to critique this, you know, use of technology. Uh, I think I use this phrase already, but I'm just going to repeat it. Students are being habituated into inattention. Anytime, you know, writing is a cognitively demanding task. It's like doing hill sprints or something. And TikTok, Twitter, Facebook, YouTube, um, Fortnite, whatever the addicting piece of media is, is just like a, a table full on a hot day when you're doing hill sprints of ice cold lemonade and popsicles and donuts calling out to you. And of course, if they're used to giving up, 
and giving into this inattention or going over to this other media, they're unable and they're not learning how to, I mean, attention is kind of a learned behavior. It's, it's hard focusing on one thing for a long time. And students aren't learning these habits of attention, how to say no to other desires and deny what's immediately easy and then focus on what's cognitively demanding because learning takes effort. Writing an essay, reading a hard book, um, thinking about and mastering a mathematical or scientific concept that takes a lot of effort. And our students are learning to just go for what's easier, to just stop the hill sprint, what's actually gonna be good for them Mm -hmm. and go towards the nice sugary lemonade and popsicles. And can you explain to the audience how that is even true when they're doing getting their assignments through a Chromebook or where the teacher is having them do everything uh, through a one-to-one device? Because I'm seeing that even going back six, seven years, I remember tutoring a high school kid locally and his mom could not for the life of her find his homework. I mean, just even on the Chromebook, couldn't figure out what his homework was, what he was supposed to do. And then I would look at it and it would take me half a session to figure out what was supposed to happen. Um, and the kid was just floundering with this, with all the stuff. And I, I, I was beside myself. I'm like, how, how is this homework? Mm-hmm. It, it was, it was the weirdest thing. So, I mean, what else is happening when they do that? I mean, you talk to me about, um, so many things go, or while you were talking, I I counted above, I have 16 tabs open, which is few compared to some people. I try to keep them to a minimum. Uh, But that's 16 different, you know, little bits, my working memory pulling at that space, that little doorway, all these things clocking it. I'm thinking about the Facebook. I see one, meaning I got a, a, a like or something a YouTube video that I'm halfway through, like four or five articles that I need to read, my email, which has a couple unread emails. All of these things are pulling at my attention, pulling my attention away from this conversation. For our students, they're going to have lots of tabs open. I know they do. They're going to be constantly, you know, anytime a teacher's not looking, going to go over to YouTube. They're going to have music playing in the background, which distracts them. Um, I know people think music helps them focus. It doesn't. All of the research shows when people take the same test, the group that is listening to music versus the group that's not listening to music, the not listening to music people always do better because music distracts. Um, So it's just the, the, these screens are just inundating with kids with distractions versus in the old days, you got a book and you got a sheet with some really well written, really, um, you know, yeah, well-written analytical questions. And that's all you have to focus on is this book and the analysis. And that's it. Um, If we want to get into some more of the research, when people read on screens, even Kindles, they do not recall or comprehend what they read as well. Like I said earlier, when you take notes by hand versus on screen, you remember way better when you take notes by hand. Schools that ban phones, um, even things like the kids get more exercise at recess when schools ban phones and devices because they go outside and they don't huddle around with their friends and stare at TikTok and, you know, not talk to each other. They put them away and they go out and they play tag and they play four square and they play basketball and they run around the jungle gym and do all of those things. Just screens, schools should be a safe haven from screens, a place of quiet and contemplation and eye contact and face-to-face conversations, not facilitators of these screen addictions that we have. Right. I completely agree. I, I, I find it even as an adult, I find it, I'm less able to sit and write than I was just in, let's say 2001. I go back to 2001 when, you know, unfortunately 9-11 happened and I started a blog. I was, um, home a fair amount. And I started a blog and I was writing prolifically, like sitting there all day writing all kinds of different articles. And it came so easily. It came so easily. Now, granted, this was on a computer, but it didn't have a smartphone. There was no such thing as a smartphone, really. And, you know, Apple iPhone hadn't been invented yet. I think I had a cell phone, but it was like a flip phone. You could do, you know, you could make calls. That's it. 
And other than that, I had one of those little Mac, iMac things that looks like a little bubble. All you could really do is go to the internet. So I just wrote and wrote and wrote and it came so easily. Now people ask me like, how can you do like one article every like three months? What is your deal? And I'm like, because I start, I have at least four right now that are started. I start and I'm a perfectionist, you know, and not to say my articles are per perfection. I'm just saying I don't, I'm not satisfied to just do what I used to do of just blah, 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 blah. I want to get it right. That was for nobody. That was like, pst. now people might be coming to me and want like, information. So I'm like, oh, I got to do research. I have to make sure I get links and figure out, you know, check my facts and all this stuff. And I'll get halfway through. And it's like, oh, this, wait, what? Oh, somebody's notifying. Wait, it's, I got a phone call. So many things going on and I don't get back to it. And I'm an adult. I can't imagine being a kid who's not trying to write. Yeah, I've already learned to write. I've already learned all these things that I'm trying to do. They're trying to learn to write. They're trying to learn the facts they're going to write about. And it's not on top of other things. Like you were talking about the scientists. The other thing about the scientists is they have a wealth of knowledge from which to draw upon to formulate their hypotheses, to design their experiments and so on. Our students can't learn without a certain foundation of knowledge. I think this is something I'd love for you to talk about that a little bit, the hierarchy of knowledge, because I think parents don't really understand that what I, what I see happening in school, and this is another of the trends, I don't know what you would call it though, cart before the horse, I don't know if it has a name, where we take elementary school kids and we start asking them things, like let's say it's Black History Month, and we go to kids in you know third grade and we ask them to start talking about power and privilege and race and so forth in Selma. And we just give them this little video or something. They don't know any history. Like they've not had U.S. history. They can't even really read well. And they're jumping ahead to these complex issues and saying, well, this is important. And my brain breaks. Every time I see them, I'm like, this is just not right to do. What, what can you say to that? So active critical thinking depends on knowledge. Uh, we denigrate, oh, they're just learning facts. That's not, you know, that's not, uh, we want to do better. Learning has to be more than just the memorization of facts. When all of our like good thinking depends on factual knowledge. Yes. You know what makes really good doctors, really good doctors? They have mastered biology, human analogy, or human anatomy, pharmacology, chemistry. They have crammed their brains the scientific knowledge that when a complex patient comes in, they can think critically about that case. You know what makes a great uh, a engineer of bridges or buildings? They know a whole lot about math and physics and structural dynamics and different um, building materials and what their strengths and weaknesses are. They know a whole lot of stuff. Even you know, geology and tectonics, <laughs> depending yeah. where the bridge is going to be. <laughs> yeah. You know what's going to make somebody... Uh, some of the best critical thinkers of contemporary mm -hmm. politics are, are historians, because they can think to historical analogies, what's something like this that happened before, what did people do, what was right, what was wrong, and they can use that historical knowledge to compare and analyze and critique the present. Yeah, You have to have a base of factual knowledge to think critically about functionally anything. Heck, you have to have a base of factual knowledge to even be able to read and comprehend an op-ed. Because if the op-ed mentions the Holocaust or the civil rights movement or Abraham Lincoln, and you don't know what that is, you're not going to actually comprehend what it's what's being written. From the river to the sea, Daniel, what river? I don't know. Does it matter? It, yeah. That's a matter. great example. <laughs> It's like, you'll see people, they're like, from the river to the sea, like, what river, what sea? And then you've seen the, the man in the street interviews. These were college students. Now imagine high school students. So this is, this probably is, I mean, I have so many pet peeves about how they're teaching right now, but the, the abandonment of the understanding that knowledge is built on other knowledge seems to be the, the crux of it. Because once you do that, it's fair game for the rest of it. Now, you know, it makes it easier to say student-led. It makes it easier to say, you know, let's do project-based learning. It makes it easier to say we don't need to write with pencils and, pa and paper. We don't need to read books. Because you're not even pursuing the same goal that education was back when we were in school, which is 
the acquisition of lots and lots and lots of facts and knowledge so that you can have that to start creating, you know, analyzing and then creating. We're, we're not going to create new knowledge. We're not, how, who are the scientists going to be of tomorrow? Who are going to be the inventors? Who are going to be the people who keep us moving forward and not, God forbid, not you know moving backward? If we fail to teach a sufficient number of people, what is what we already know? And I think a lot of people are relying on AI. Do you agree with that? That they're thinking the computers will do it for us. We don't need to know. Yeah. Um, but even to do something like use AI well, you have to know something. Let's think? go back. Yeah. Let, let's go back before AI just to Google. To ask Google good questions or to search well to figure something out. You know, I'm going to keep using engineering. I couldn't use Google to learn about engineering necessarily because I don't even know the vocabulary I would have to type into the Google search bar to find the information. And then once that article comes up, I don't have the base of knowledge to understand what I'm reading. Even with AI, human like the human cognitive architecture hasn't changed. Technology might change, but human nature is the same. And so the way we're going to learn is still going to be the same. We still have to know stuff to be able to think and read right. and comprehend well. Yeah. And and I really want people to hear this. This is so important because this is not happening. I mean, I really feel like we're we're just I'm seeing kids in school be given all kinds of technological tools and they don't know what to ask. And I genuinely think that the kids are anxious in part. There are many reasons they're getting more anxious, but one of the reasons is they deep down know they don't know things. And the older they get, I think the worse it gets for them. And even if they can't articulate it that way and say, you know, I'm anxious because I don't understand how anything works. Um, I think knowing that you're dependent, as I said, you know, it's not something that you own knowledge, but it's out there. It creates a sense of dependent, the sense of anxiety that let's say little kids have more fear of the dark because they don't know what the dark is and they don't know what really goes on under the bed. And, you know, it's the same thing. Just keep adding years to it and make it a little more complex. But the, that what I don't know, the bigger that is, the more fear you're going to have about people, life, new situations, change, conflict, all that stuff. And I don't think you can come in and, and that's the irony. They're not direct teaching. They're not, they're not teaching the things that you're talking about. Let's teach you Napoleon. Let's teach algebra. But they are trying, and let's talk about this for a moment, to direct instruct how to manage your emotions, social emotional learning. Like let's have, let's have a session to talk about your feelings about things, your feelings about people. And this is the one thing I think you genuinely cannot teach to a classroom full of 30 people. Like it's just, that's not how we learned it. We learned from our parents, maybe church, synagogue, out in the neighborhood with your friends and your sports team, mishmash of all that. You learned because you got in a fight, maybe you got a black guy, then you, you know, made up, whatever. Your social and emotional skills are learned the same way your daughter learned to speak and walk and eat with a spoon not because a teacher taught them. Am I on target with that? Or am I just, again, yeah, like that. old and so crusty? Many, there are so many things that factor into our personalities and sort of social emotional capacities. I don't even want to use skills, right. um, but our ability to manage our self, you know, family influence, cultural influence, genes, upbringing, friends. Um, personality is a thing. Yeah, key it's like real. key experiences, both <laughs> yeah. positive and negative in life. All of these things make your personality. You can't really like there's not a lot that uh five minute lesson on compassion or a few posters that say kindness is cool. That's not gonna change a kid's ability to manage their emotions. Um what's more, the things that we actually could do to help kids manage their emotions, like dole out consequences, like you're angry, you punched a kid, uh, you got lunch detention for a week, and now you're going to reconsider acting out in anger. That's now considered mean and oppressive, giving kids and forming their characters through discipline and order. So those are the things that might actually work to form a kid's character. We're not allowed to do that. So instead, we're just going to tell them that kindness is cool and um, make them... <laughs> 
talk about their traumas in class. What we do know how to do is teach kids academics. We might fail at it because of you know, recalcitrant unions and super woke schools of education and general ennui and calcified bureaucracies. All of these things might keep us from actually teaching content knowledge and math and science and history and English and all of these things and phonics and grammar. We know how to teach those things pretty well. Yeah, that's the inability for, for for the students to learn those things or even for some teachers to teach them is not a failure of those teaching methods. Mm -hmm. It is this what you just described. All these are things that make it or that are not allowing us to use them or that are in the way in the screens and the lack of discipline. And you can't you can be the best teacher in the world. Look, truly, like award-winning, you could be John Taylor flipping Gatto. <laughs> and if you have a room full of kids that you cannot discipline, like no way, no how. I know he was not a big strict disciplinarian or anything, but if you can't and they've got technology, I, I don't think even, even he could manage it. There's, there's mm -hmm. just not some magic pixie dust that award-winning teachers have that can overcome a completely unruly classroom or you have no authority to send the instigator or a couple of instigators out of the room and restore order or dole out a, a consequence that might dissuade them from doing it the next time. And I think people hear this and they think it's about punishment. Why do you have to punish? It's like it's consequences don't necessarily have to be punitive. You know, like that if it fits the crime, so to speak, you're not allowing somebody else the peace and quiet to learn, you're taking that away. So you're going to go somewhere where it's quiet and peaceful and you're going to sit there so that you know you have it, they have it, everybody's got the same thing. And then I don't see how that's punitive. It's not like you're hitting the kid. It's not like people say, well, you're depriving them of the opportunity to be in the class. They're not learning anyway. They're not listening and they're making it impossible for everybody else to learn. So I don't know. I just, I would love to see you start a Michaela school here in the United States. <laughs> That's what I would love to see you do. Um, I think we need more people like, you know, Catherine Burble saying, and, and, and people who see the value in boundaries, especially again, to your point, those populations of students that we say we care so much about who actually legitimately do come from more chaotic environments. They don't have as many natural boundaries put on them at home. Uh, so the, if you're in chaos, you, you almost want, I would think you might not be aware that you want it, but boundaries, clear, consistent. This is what is, you know, for some kids that will be then their safe space. Mm -hmm. The school becomes safer than the chaotic. In fact, I've just read something the other day that said there's a higher correlation between chaos and inability to learn than any of the other things. It is just like when you're in, when you're in chaos, you can't, you can't focus on anything. Forget it. Whether it's screen or writing, you can't, you can't, your brain just is like checked out. So I, I can't believe, uh, you know, what do you think would be the most effective? If you could change one thing discipline wise in schools today, what would you change? Gosh, I wrote a piece for for them recently. I'm really not trying to pitch and plug my own writing. Um, Do it. I try, <laughs> try to answer this question. Um, what is wrong with their schools? Available on Amazon. Uh, there, I pitched it. Yeah. Uh, well, I tried to That's give great. like, okay, what are what are actual discipline policies and changes that we can make that would promote good behavior? Um, and there's a there's six that I say in there. One of them, principals can't return a kid to class without giving some sort of consequence, unless the teacher's like totally out of line. And, you know, there's obviously outliers and nuanced situations that we have to consider. But generally speaking, you know, I have, I had sent kids, I don't, I didn't rely on the administration much because I wanted to handle my business inside my own classroom. Sure, sure, sure. I was mm -hmm. the adult and the authority in there. I don't need to rely on other people. But sometimes you do. Some things happen, things happen where it happens in the hall and you see it radio for admin and they brought the kid back five minutes later with the bag of chips and what does that communicate to the kid if you misbehave 
You get to go hang out, out of the classroom for 10 minutes, sit in a comfy chair in the office, eat some hot Cheetos, and then go back and keep doing what you do. Uh, So that's one. Um, I would, I can't believe I'm saying this as a conservative, but I want to see some local unions walk out. The national unions are all bought into kind of the soft on consequences, restorative justice, punishment is mean and oppressive, but local unions um, and local teachers are fed up with chaos in the classroom. And I want to see some people walk out um, and force administrations to change not walking out because their $93,000 paycheck is too small or Mm -hmm. they're getting a 4% pay raise versus a 5% pay raise. I want to see unions walk out if they're going to over something like discipline and behavior. Right. Those are two. I, I, I agree. And like you, I'm not, you know, exactly the most pro union, but if there's one purpose that a union should serve, it would be to protect the employees. I mean, that was kind of the point, wasn't it? I mean, it's not just about money. You need to have safe working conditions and working conditions that don't make you go insane. And because otherwise people will just leave. Rational, decent people who have other options are getting out. They're not going to stay. Yeah. They're not going to stay and be abused and have it be that you can't, if you can't be effective at your job, it destroys your morale. So setting people up to fail, which is what I think it is doing, it sets teachers up to fail at their job. And if you have a teacher who got into teaching for you know the right reasons, they care about the kids, they genuinely want to do something good. Nobody goes into it to get rich. So they're, you know, now they're ticking off boxes of reasons not to stay. There are only a few reasons to do it in the first place. And passion was one of them. You kill that. It's forget it. And that's what I've never understood about the unions, especially the big nationals, is this is not even on their radar. They don't discuss it, or to your point, they discuss the restorative justice and the social justice piece, which would puzzle me more if I didn't understand some deeper things about what they want. I just don't see how it benefits their members long term because those local, you know, people stop paying the dues. They're like, at a minimum, keep me safe. I'm not going to get beat up. So I think you're right. I think that is important as long as we're going to have public schools and have public school unions, that should be way up there. Um, So I guess, you know, we've covered most of the the things. I feel like I may have forgotten, you know, any of the teaching methods, but we did touch on SEL and and some of that and even AI. Um, Is there anything I forgot in terms of things you were asked to do in the classroom or felt pressure to do because it was popular or, or whatever that you think parents need to know about. This is not actually working. There's a better way. I think I brought this up last time when I was on here, but it's just be so aware of false promises and euphonious sounding learning styles. Oh, that's one that we didn't get into learning styles. Yeah. Yeah. Um, there, there's no such thing as the difference. Go ahead, visual. go ahead. Because, you know, I said I could do a whole thing, but you're yeah. here. I don't get you here that often. You're a busy guy. Give us, give us your, your, it, it, it's bogus, but I want to hear the Dan LeBuck uh, explanation why it's bogus. In brief, the concept of learning styles, oh, well, it doesn't fit my son or daughter's learning style. It has as much grounding in science as, you know, homeopathic medicine or astrology. It's a pseudoscience. It's not real. Um, we have far more in common with how we learn, notwithstanding a few outliers. There's outliers to any theory, right? Dogs have four legs. Some dogs have three legs. Okay. That doesn't change the fact that 99.9% of dogs have four legs. Um, 99.9% of humans learn just about the same. Our cognitive architecture, working memory, long-term memory, primary learning, secondary learning, the need to for quiet, to focus on what you're doing. These things don't change from human to human. Um, all new knowledge comes from outside us and it, ca- it can come from a teacher or it can come from a book. It can come from a YouTube video, but it has to come externally. And then we process it in our working memory and it goes into our long-term memory. That's how everybody learns. Right. This idea that we have different learning styles there has, there's not a single study that has ever been done that shows pairing one modality of learning, if it's audio or 
visual or reading, pairing that with a supposed learning style results in better learning. Yep. Learning styles was invented by this guy, Howard Gardner, I believe his name was, at Harvard. And he, he literally just made it up. Yep. The book. He just made it up. And he got caught pretty early on, but for whatever reason, it's stuck. Because it's so appealing and it's yeah. an excuse for why kids don't learn, right? Oh, well, my test scores aren't that great because the school won't let me personalize to everyone's learning style. Uh, and it's warm and fuzzy and it's, it's, like I said, euphonious. So it just perpetuates. And it has been disproven and smacked down more times than I can count, but it just keeps going on and on and on. It's this pseudoscientific concept of learning styles. The other one, I mean, personalized learning, differentiation, these are all promising, but they just don't work in practice for a number of different reasons. Individualized right. learning uh, often results in collective neglect. So, I mean, right. if you're going to homeschool your kid one-on-one, -on -one, that's one thing, but in a classroom of 30, yeah, I, you know, I got 50 minutes. That means I get one minute with every kid and all the rest of the time, all the other kids are getting ignored right. versus whole class instruction. You know, not every kid has learned about the war of 1812. So I'm going to in actively, engagingly give some lecture, give some call and response, some reading, some questions to all of the kids. Now, every single kid in that room has the full attention of the teacher for the whole hour. Exactly. Dif differentiation, the idea that we're going to ask teachers to come up with basically, again, it, it sort of just individualized learning, 30 different variations on the same activity for one kid. And sometimes that differentiation actually works against their learning. Uh, you know, one common one is you're going to give different kids different difficulties of learning, which means you give challenging content to the so-called smart kids. And then you make the questions or the reading easier for right. the lower learners. And the, I mean, when I was in grad school, they told us that was racist. Uh -huh. they, literally, I was told like, that's tracking and tracking is, is, is racist to go at different paces, you know, for different, or, you know, like where, where you're giving them different questions. In fact, they called it the hierarchical curriculum and said it was bad. And that was university of Pennsylvania that now says, oh no, we need to use AI to differentiate the learning according to what the the level the student is at now. And I'm like, they're never going to get up here if you keep them where they, like, we're gonna go give you easy questions and then a little bit harder, but you know, not much harder, whatever. I think, yeah, this drives me crazy because kids, even the, if you're a seasoned teacher and even not that seasoned, I was my second year of teaching in a, in a first grade classroom of like 30 kids, I knew who was, a little bored. And I knew who was needing extra help. You know, if you're paying attention and you're kind of observing and you spend, you know, your certain amount of time here and then you're walking around the room and walking around the room, Marva Collins style, like, you know, what's going on, you know, you, by the second week of school, you kind of know who are my kids going to need a little extra and who are the kids that I, I need to give them more challenging, like, cause they're going to, they're going to be bored. Um, it didn't change the overall way of like, this is what we're going to teach. And I'm giving you all the same information and all the same questions. I just might spend two more minutes at your desk. Mm -hmm. Okay. That's how it was done when I was a kid. That's how I learned. I don't know if that's how you learned, but it worked. Is it perfect? No, it's not perfect. You have 30 kids in a room. I mean, there's a limit to what you can do, but it, it was far better than I can't imagine managing to like four sets of questions. It, I, what's coming to my mind right now is this video that went semi-viral on Twitter and like the education sphere and everyone was praising it and loving it. And I was repulsed by it. Oh and God. it was, uh, it's like modern classroom where there were stations set up and every kid had their own laptop. And then the stations had like four or five kids at each. And then there's a screen that they were all also like playing a game on together on their screens, just staring at their screens, all collectively playing this little video game together on the screens. And the teacher was just in the background with his arms crossed watching it all happen. And I was like, oh, this is so modern and they're all so engaged. And I'm just like, they're anesthetized by screens. 
they're amusing themselves to death. What's that famous? What's that book called? Is it um, amusing ourselves to death? Entertaining ourselves to death? I'm not sure. That's all right. You don't need to okay, know. Okay. Yeah. Um, but it just it it's uh, if that's what modern education is. I don't I don't want anything to do with it. Yeah, I don't. I yeah, I don't think it's amusing ourselves to death. Public discourse in the age of um, uh, in the age of show business. Neil Postman. Mm -hmm. Um, but yeah, I, 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 and I, I'm seeing that, that, that kids need to be amused. They need to be entertained and adults are because we have so few adults who seem comfortable in a position of authority. And I don't mean like position of power. There's a difference. There's authority. There's, there's, um, you know, responsibility and being a mature, responsible adult or authoritative, not authoritarian. And I don't see most adults, especially young ones, you know, comfortable with that. They want to be called by their first name. They want to dress like the kids, dance like the kids, sing with the kids. Like we're buddies. We're, you know, these are my kiddos and all this. And I think, and, and at what point, I see parents do too. And at what point are you going to be able to assert the authority you have to assert to run an orderly classroom and get these kids over the finish line, you know, like where they need to be. Um, if you start off that way, if that's your culture of your classroom, or if that's the attitude and they just seem so uncomfortable with that, that it, they've attached all kinds of negative words to it, uh, negative ideas attached to it. So even when you and I bring these ideas up, they're just sort of like, what is wrong with you? And I'm like, okay, but what you're doing is not working. So can we talk about that? You know, it's that you you say we're mean and terrible, but what you're doing isn't working. Yeah. I mean, we used we used to understand the concept of tough love. Yeah. The coach that makes their team run 400 suicides because they know it's going to make them better. Tough In the love. heat. In the heat. Uh-huh. <laughs> or chewing a kid out when they did something wrong because they did something wrong and they need to acknowledge it. Maybe they should feel a little bad for it. Sorry. You punched Timmy. That wasn't okay. That's um, right. We used You'll to get over that, it. You're not going to break. Yeah. And or how do... Ugh. That good things take hard work. Um, you know, the greatest musicians ever didn't just kind of one day wake up and write Beethoven's fifth. They mm -hmm. sat down. There's in jazz. There's a concept called shedding, which comes from Charlie Parker, who went into his backyard and practiced scales for 12 hours a day. And he's one of the greatest jazz musicians ever because he sat down and worked incredibly hard. And sometimes it was boring and sometimes it was drawl or I don't know what word I'm looking for. We used to understand that, that right. not everything has to be fun all the time. Not everything has to be engaging all the time. Sometimes the most important things in this world take effort, aren't always the first thing we want to do. Right. What do I want to do sometimes? I want to sit down and play video games. That's what's engaging. Right. Not reading, making myself a better person, working out, um, playing with my daughter, all of these kinds of things. What's immediately easy and engaging and fun is often what's really bad for us. Yeah. And I, and I think at this point, I don't know, it's a symbiotic relationship. I don't know where it begins and where it leaves off. You know, that teachers want to blame parents, parents want to blame teachers. And honestly, I still like, I give parents a lot of grace because they're sort of led to like, this is what we're doing and we're the experts and this is how it goes. So I don't want to lay it on them, but I will say that the people who are responsible for fixing it are going to have to be parents because you can't change the system. Like, you know, that's not happening no matter how bad you want it and no matter how many people you get in your group or whatever to want it. So you can change it for your kid. And this is where I think it gets really hard. And I do have a lot of empathy, still raising kids myself, that if you're the only parent amongst your kid's friend group that's saying, okay, I'm limiting the phone, I'm limiting the video games, I'm making you read books, and you, you know, you can't do this. It is so, so hard. And so a lot of parents, I think, give in because they're like, I don't want to be the weird one. And I don't want my kid to be the weird one. And I, you know, how do I do that? And I would say to parents like who have young, very young kids like you, you have time. Don't, you know, build your community, build a community of like-minded parents who aren't going to do that so that when it comes time, you're ready where it's like, I know that the people in my 
periphery are just like me and they're not going to have the phones and my daughter's going to have a peer group of parent and the parents that we're going to hang out with are going to do these things. So if you're on the younger side or just having kids, this is for you. This is advice from those of us who sort of didn't really have a choice. Whoop, one day we woke up, our kids were in seventh grade and there were smartphones um, and everybody had them. So you have time, take advantage and uh, plan, prepare, take, listen to what we've said and say, I'm not going to even let this into my child's life from the get go. And then I don't have to be the mean, horrible villain taking it away because I, you know, your life shouldn't be arbitrarily hard. No, I'm going to send him to public school and then I'm going to be, I'm going to be the, you know, drill sergeant. Good luck with that. <laughs> it's not easy. Um, all right. So we talked about the learning styles and the phones and all the things. And I guess like the very, very, very last thing, and it's a little controversial, but you've probably seen the, you know, all the push to like get certain books out of libraries and so on. And, and being conservative, I know you're, you know, probably for free speech and think, you know, we should, that said, can you help parents understand that there really is such a thing as age appropriate? So that in other words, at least I don't feel like, I don't like bans. I still don't want to ban anything. But it, when it comes to a school, this is a curated collection. <laughs> this is not every book, every ISDN in, in the world. So first of all, I think curation is okay. But parents seem to be having a lot of trouble, those who don't want the books, articulating what age appropriate means so that they don't get caught up in just a puerile conversation about porn. Right. Yeah. And, it, and where people go, Oh, you're just, you're just icked out because it's LGBT issues, whatever. It's like, no, it's, there are just some topics and themes that are not age appropriate. And then, you know, if you're talking about upper high school, okay, it's in the library. Maybe a kid doesn't have to look at it. There's also a difference between explicit instruction of the book and mandatory reading and it's sitting on the shelf. And if the kid's going to go get it, there's nothing to do about it. Can you help us understand the nuances of this? Well, I'm big free, free speech guy. Love free speech. I think basically every topic should be debated, even the icky, ucky ones. Right. Um, Same. <laughs> like, have the conversation. It doesn't mean we need to like have it on national television, but like right. nothing's, off the, nothing's off the table. Let's argue at all because sometimes you find out something new. Anyways, we don't need to go there. Love free speech. Kindergarten classroom doesn't need to be the place where we read Mein Kampf. That's not what, like the kindergarten classroom doesn't have to be this grand societal open debate. That's not like free speech relates to what can the government um, sanction for you saying in the public square, not in a closed venue like a kindergarten classroom or in my own house or in a restaurant right when you're on somebody's private property they have the right to kick you off the property for saying whatever because it's their property that's not where free speech goes um and maybe the law will come in because you're refusing to like get off somebody's property but kindergarten classroom doesn't have to be this place of free and open public debate that said you kind of touched on this when it comes to books we have to differentiate between uh changing curriculum right we saw all of these ridiculous headlines about how the graphic novel mouse was banned it's about the holocaust it's banned oh my gosh we're nazi germany it's literally a school district in tennessee that took it off the assigned curriculum kids could still read it if i'm not mistaken it was still in the library it's just yes, they took it took off was. the curriculum Mm -hmm. And then we're going to do something like, you know, the diary of Anne Frank instead. Right. You know, I, I one year read um, Frederick Douglass's autobiography with my seventh graders and halfway through realized like, oh, this is way too intense for them, way too graphic. There's a lot of, not a lot, but there's vulgarity. You see it's in writing, but somebody get their head blown off and it's described very graphically. It's a very violent book and I had forgotten that. And you know what I didn't do next year? I didn't read Frederick Douglass's autobiography with seventh graders. I read, I think it was A Raisin in the Sun instead, because it's just mm -hmm. a little less graphic and vulgar. And it touches on a lot of same themes, but it's more age appropriate. Right. There's a whole, it, so changing the curriculum, there's changing what's actually in the public school library. You can fit maybe 10,000 books in a library. Um, I don't know. 
maybe there shouldn't be books that show graphic sex acts in an elementary school library. We have to have a limiting principle somewhere. Right. Um, I don't want some uh, school shooters manifesto bound and put on a public school library. Like we have to have limiting principles. We have to make choices and curate what's in that library and what isn't, what do we put on display? What isn't there's um, next level up of banning. There's um, deplatforming books from Amazon, Target, Barnes and Noble. I don't see anybody to do that. The left does that. Oh, to... but yes. That, you know, Abigail Schreier and people like that. No, I definitely have seen it the other way around. I'm saying from the people like Moms for Liberty who are getting yeah. so much heat about the books that they would like to not see in the school, public school libraries. And the argument seems to be, who are you to tell other parents what is okay for their kids? And I, and I, this, I can't stand this argument because isn't that what public school literally does? It tells all parents what's okay for their kids. And we tolerate it up to a certain point. But what I think I hear them saying is, okay, you've gone too far. You Now you're coming into the personal. Now you're coming into things that are typically reserved for parents to teach um, and that are, I think, arguably not age appropriate for all the children in this particular environment. And do we really want to send a message as adults that we are sanctioning, promoting certain things at, or because it's a public school that the government is promoting certain ideas as fact that aren't really fact, you know, is this kind of akin to teaching religion, those sorts of things. And, and yet I hear this, who are you to, are we that far gone in our civics instruction that you have adults who don't understand they can go over to Barnes and Noble and buy it for their own kid or go to the library and take it out for their own kid. And that the, the public school is not obligated to provide everything they might want their child to read either. Like, I'm not going where the Thomas Hull books. Come on, let's go. You know, and they're not there. <laughs> yeah, no, they're not. Uh, Cato did some research on that recently. Pretty sure and, this know. isn't there. I could be wrong, but, you know, it's a wild guess. <laughs> yeah, it's, they're public schools or public institutions where everyone is supposed to have a say. Um, and the left seems to get this backwards, where they want politics in the classroom, but not at the school board, when it should be the other way around. We should be having these fights about what books are on the curriculum and what's in the library and what are our kids learning in the school boards, in the state legislatures, and then no politics in the classroom. And right. it's just, it's completely, people have it backwards. backwards. Yeah, that's for the adults. And, and, I, and I feel so retro saying that. It is so weird. It used to be a thing. It was like, you'd say it and people go, and water is wet. You know? <laughs> but now you say politics or what else? And it's like, no, youth action, student voice, and, you know, action civics and all, you know, in, in fifth grade. And, and I'm just speechless. I'm speechless because I, I don't understand. I mean, I know the steps it took to get us here, but what's hard for me to to accept is that so many parents didn't speak up and say no before we got to this point. So that's part of why I'm doing this and having you on and having you talk about this is I want people to now hear about the learning and what does work and what doesn't work. So when you hear the school talk about the things we've talked about or say this is necessary, my hope is that you'll remember this conversation and at least ask questions like according to whom, where's the research, why this, not that, and and these kinds of really relevant substantive questions, because you're unlikely to have success if you just come right out of the gate going, stop doing project-based learning. <laughs> I mean, it might be what you feel, but it's probably not going to work out as well as, can we see the data and how well it's worked since, you know. And, and beware, um, education research is notoriously awful. Yes. Uh, so there's a lot of, they'll say, well, the research says, Right. Say, give me a citation and you exactly. open it up and there's no research. Right. It's a professor. There's a lot of project-based learning literature that is a professor explaining why this ought to work. That's right. Not actually seeing if it does in practice, but saying, well, here it's, it should do this and this is how it might work. Or the other one you'll see is they implement some project-based learning program and the professor's there observing it every day and conversing with the teacher mm -hmm. and really good curriculum and the teacher's getting coached on it. And they're also reflect, there's all of these variables, right? right. You're supposed to, you control for one variable, all of these variables. 
and the professor just kind of goes, it's like kids seem to vibe with it, vibe with it. It seemed to work. Right, right. Um, and then the other one is there's no control group or there's right. no comparison. Yeah. And most any educational intervention is going to work better than nothing. Right. Um, so if you say, oh, we did project-based learning and reading scores went up. Well, sure. If I gave a kid, you know, Shakespeare and said, parse through this on your own independently, and they were alone in a room for a week, they might get better at reading. But how well does project-based learning work compared to something like explicit teaching or some drill and kill, you know, running through practice problems, all this kind of old traditional stuff that we used right. to know works. Um, so be aware of bad research too. Yeah, that's a really good point. And also I've learned over the years not to be wooed by scores went up because you have to remember that, first of all, what scores, like how did you, what was the test? What was the content on the test? What was the methodology? And they have they changed the test? Because very often they change the test somewhere in between that. So it's not really an accurate measurement of whether it went up or down. They might've just changed their, their scoring system, made it easier and so on. So I'm never wooed by that. You get, look at your own child. That's why I say this is a this is is a problem that seems like a collective problem, but the solution is individual. You've got to look at your own kid. And when somebody's trying to sell you on this is necessary, that's necessary, this works or that doesn't work, you don't need to look at anybody else. Look at your child. Hand them a book. Have them read you a page. Can they do it? Did they can they remember what they just read? Um, that's going to give you the best indicator. Well, Daniel, this has been very helpful. I have to say, um, you know, not 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 a lot of surprises, but I feel a little better. <laughs> I was starting to feel like maybe I'm just, uh, you know, too old school or something, but you've been in the classroom more recently. You've seen what works, um, what works less well and why. And I'm really glad that you were able to spare the time and come and talk to us. So thank you. So uh, where can people go and read your stuff at Fordham? Like yep. Fordham and then National Review is the other place that I write the most for Okay. Kind of right all over the place. But yeah, mostly Fordham and National Review on Twitter at Mr. Daniel Buck. The book is What is Wrong with Our Schools, available on Amazon and yes. I think Barnes and Noble and Target. I don't even know. I'm bad at promoting myself. I just want to it's, talk about ideas. It's a great book. I like we I read it and I we did a show last year. I will go put the link down below. Um, you guys really do need to read it. It's not a long book, but it's what I loved about it is it's accessible. It's a book parents can read about education, which is rare. I think Edie Hirsch is the only other person I've read where, you know, you here's a, an education writer who can write in ways that the average person can pick it up and read it and understand what he's talking about. And his book is, an, is another one that I think people should read, the more recent one of um, education for, remind me the title. It's right. How, is it How to Educate a Citizen? Thank you. Is that I it? I think it's, it's something like that. Yeah. About our, our shared culture and how important it is. <laughs> yeah, I'm trying to find it on my bookshelf. I have it up right? there somewhere, it's but it's like not, they're not right alphabetized there, right so now. My brain is so fried that, um, yeah, because of all the distractions in the open tabs <laughs> that my working memory <laughs> is just terrible, that plus senility, and I, no, I'm kidding. Um, anyway, so thank you so much. I hope you come back sometime in the future, and I'm sure I'll ping you again and be like, hey, Daniel, I got a question. Uh, but this has been really helpful, and I hope you continue to enjoy wonderful weather up there and thanks everybody for watching yeah See. thanks for having me on and i love talking about politics and culture war debates and i think they're important and they're fun but man i just much prefer education philosophy and instructional practices and all that kind of stuff because i'm a yeah. nerd I'm yeah no but i mean it. that's why i asked you here because this is like people need to know what you know there's so much noise and so much about the culture and like, hi, remember like learning? Remember the thing we're supposed to do at school? Like, you know, leave the politics out of it. Like the kids need to read. Mm -hmm. It's kind of hard to be free. I think Frederick Douglass would have a thing or two to say about this. It's hard to be free if you're illiterate. You're yep. not really free. You're at the mercy of, you're at the mercy of people who can read and write and do math. And if you don't want your child to be the mercy of this thing, like literally the power goes out and I don't know anything, including where I am because I can't read a map. Um, then the way you protect your children is you make sure that they actually learn. So that's my take. But thanks, everybody. We'll see you next time.